Welcome to post-transplant discharge teaching. Um, the slide that you are currently looking at just introduces you to the entire team for post-transplant. You did have a pre-transplant coordinator who got you ready for your transplant. You will now have a post-transplant coordinator. And when you have questions, we will specifically address which one is yours. But everyone's phone number is there. You have access to a transplant coordinator 24-7. So during normal business hours, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., you call the general office number at the 513-584-7001, option 1. And an assistant will pick up the phone and triage your call. You may also leave your coordinator a message, but be advised she may not get back to you until later in the day or the following day. If it is after hours and you have an emergency, 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., Monday through Friday, and 24 hours a day on the weekends and the seven major holidays of the year, you call the hospital operator at 513-584-1000 and be sure to ask for the kidney transplant coordinator on call. You may also communicate through my chart, which we will talk about ensuring that you are signed up for this. Please make sure if you are communicating through my chart, it is not something that is an emergency and that you need an answer for within 24 hours. We have provided quick reference phone numbers. Please place this on your refrigerator. That way, if one of your alternative caregivers is taking care of you, they know where these emergency numbers are. Please be advised, do not call your primary coordinator's direct line after hours or on weekends and holidays. They are not checking voicemail when they are not here. The three C's of transplant, compliancy, consistency, and communication. Compliancy and consistency is in regards to your appointments. We monitor your labs and see you frequently in the beginning because this is when you are at the greatest risk for rejecting your organ or having a complication. Please try not to miss those appointments. Compliancy and consistency is with your medications. 12-hour dosing is very important. Yes, there is flexibility of 30 minutes, 40 minutes on either side, but you want to try and stay with that same time every day, such as 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., and we will discuss a specific time frame according to your appointments. Communication. This is two-way. There was a lot of communication that went into getting you ready for your transplant. That communication cannot stop at this point in time. We need to be aware of anything and everything that is going on. Sometimes it's not something we can physically see. So unless you tell us, we don't know what's going on. So please be very open with us. Also, the two-way communication. Your team should be telling you everything you need to know at your appointments. Please do not hesitate to ask questions. The dietitian will be in either prior to my education or after my education. There are a lot of lifestyle adjustments when it comes to your diet. Um, caffeine and carbonation are not added to that because we want you to sort of feel like you still have some leeway in your life, but these two items should be used in moderation. Caffeine will actually dehydrate you, so we request that you li limit your caffeine intake to 8 to 12 ounces today and then add additional water with that. Carbonation causes bloating and possible loss of appetite. Try to drink your carbonated beverage after your meal. A carbonated beverage has no nutritional value to it. This slide reviews your appointment schedule. 
as you see it is Monday Friday for the first month once a week either Monday or Friday for the second month and then it will be every other week the third month either that Monday or that Friday once you have reached your three months your coordinator will give you a letter congratulating you on making it to 90 days with your instructions for what you are to do for the next three months it is very important on your appointment days that you eat before your appointment unless instructed differently you are to bring your medication card that pharmacy will be giving you we do review your medication list every appointment. Please bring your pill box if you're having issues packing your pill box. And make sure if you have a question regarding one of your newer medications, please bring it in the bottle, not just that loose pill in your pocket, and then we have to try to identify it. You will be bringing your vital sign sheet, which I will be showing you. You will always get your labs drawn on the first floor of the outpatient building before coming upstairs. Please do not take your tacrolimus on the days of blood work until after your blood work is obtained. This is ensuring that we have a 12 hour trough level, which is how we will adjust your tacrolimus dose. So on Sunday night before a Monday morning appointment, an example, you will take your medicine at 9 p.m. You get up Monday morning, you get ready to come to clinic. You do not take your morning dose of medication of tacrolimus, but bring it with you. You will stop at that lab. Once they draw your blood work, you can then proceed to take your tacrolimus. Please bring a snack and water to your appointments, and we recommend you bring your caregiver for the first six weeks. When it comes to resuming driving after transplant, we encourage you to think about safety for you and safety of others. Initially, your appointments could be up to three hours long in the beginning. This is because your needs immediately after transplant are greater than what they're going to be, say, in three months or six months. Plus, we do like to see the majority of your blood work before we let you return to your home. Majority of your blood work will result prior to leaving the appointment, thus enabling us to review your serum creatinine, which is one of the most important levels that we are following at this time. There are times where we do need to follow up with some additional testing. Cell sept intercolumus, your two most important medications for the rest of your life. They are anti-rejection immunosuppressant agents. They do exactly what they sound like they do. They keep you from rejecting your transplanted organ, but they do this by suppressing your immune system. Immediately after transplant, your immune system is extremely immunosuppressed. That is because you just had a major surgery. We gave you four to five doses of a very strong medicine called thymoglobulin through your IV while you were in the hospital to really deplete your immune system and we have now started cell sept antichrolimus so right now your immune system is extremely low so in the beginning we do help to keep you from getting infections for the first three to six months after transplant and we will talk about those medicines in just a second here um, and then we are also going to talk about things that you must be doing in order to protect yourself from infections for the rest of your life. One of the preventative or prophylaxis medicines is Bactrim, which is an antibiotic. Um, if you are allergic to sulfa drugs, we will substitute something else for that. Um, but you will be on this three days a week 
for six months and your coordinator will tell you exactly when you are to stop this and this keeps you from getting bacterial infections specifically PJP pneumonia valcyte or valgan cyclovir or acyclovir is to prevent cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus infections you will be taking this anywhere from three months to six months and this is based on blood work between you and your donor and again your primary coordinator will let you know when you are to finish this medication it is very important with all the changes that we have done to your immune system that you do good oral hygiene to prevent fungal infections such as thrush and just generalized oral sores please be brushing your teeth twice a day we do want you to keep up with dental visits but we prefer you not go to a dentist for the minimum of three months after transplant if you would develop thrush or any fungal infections in your mouth please call us and we will give you something to help clear that up as far as medications over the counter we get many questions on this for allergies it is safe to take claritin or zyrtec for colds if you have elevated blood pressure our number one go-to is coracetin hbp it is also okay to take mucinex or robitussin of the cold medicines and the allergy medicines they all have counter medicines mucinex d claritin d zyrtec d d is pseudoephedrine which is a dehydrator uh, we would prefer that you avoid this medication altogether for minor aches and pains it is tylenol or acetaminophen only you are not to take any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as motrin aleve naproxen celebrex toradol ibuprofen please make sure you are allowing your primary care physician and any providers involved in your care know this so they do not inadvertently prescribe any of these medications for you we are going to talk a little bit about rejection no you don't have rejection at this point in time but you do need to be aware of what rejection is and what you need to be looking for keep in mind rejection can be treated it is easier to treat if we catch it early which is one of the reasons we do blood work two times a week in the beginning and having an episode of rejection does not mean you lose the transplanted kidney there are basically three types of rejection cellular rejection where the actual cells of the kidney become inflamed and we can see that on a sample of the kidney that we get with a biopsy antibody mediated when your body develops antibodies to the new organ and then the third type is mixed and that is a combination of the cellular and antibody mediated rejection as i stated rejection is treatable and the treatment is determined by the type of rejection you are having as well as the severity of the rejection what is rejection it is when your body recognizes the new organ is foreign and it wants to attack it if you are a first-time kidney transplant recipient your risk of rejection in the first year is roughly 10 percent of those 10 percent 90 percent of those occur in the first 90 days after transplant and that is because the kidney is still new to your body an analogy for you think of your kidney as a new toy for a child and when they get that toy they play with it a lot and over time they lose interest in that toy that is how our bodies react to a new transplanted organ 
it's very new, so it's very attentive to it, and eventually your body resigns itself that the kidney is there to stay. Um, but you will always need your immunosuppression medication for the rest of your life. In the event you do have an episode of rejection, keep in mind we don't just treat your rejection and let you go on about your daily business after that. We do follow your blood work more closely after an episode of rejection. We may see you a little bit more frequently than what your original schedule had been just to ensure that we have taken care of that episode of rejection. Signs of rejection. Remember, we catch it early, it is easier to treat. Fever, greater than 100.4. Swelling or weight gain of greater than five pounds in a 24 hour time period once we get you back down to your dry weight. Significant decrease in your urine output swelling or tenderness at the graft site once it is healed, and then flu-like symptoms. And I'm not talking flu-like symptoms like cold, like no nasal and sore throat. I'm talking body aches, chills, the type of symptoms where you just want to crawl back into bed, pull your covers up over your head, and tell everybody to leave you alone. Those are reasons to be giving us a call immediately even if it is in the middle of the night. Protecting yourself against infection. This is extremely important for the rest of your life. You do want to establish some new ground rules for family and friends. It is okay to hug family, kiss family, immediate close friends, but the rest of the population Get in the habit of doing fist bumps. The majority of the world does not wash their hands even after using the bathroom. Carry hand sanitizer with you at all times. Think about what you touch in your day-to-day -day life from as simple as a doorknob. Um, gas pumps. They say money is really, really dirty. Menus in a restaurant. Um, just You can never hand sanitize your hands too much. Um, we encourage for the first month at least to not go into crowds, such as a grocery store, a department store, concerts, um, places where you know sick people are, might be, like a pharmacy. Um, please try to avoid that. As far as pets, pets are great because they can be very therapeutic to everyone. Just keep in mind your pets need to be immunized, clean, and you are never allowed to pick up animal feces ever again. Um, also, you want to avoid having your pets lick on you. And you want to wash your hands after handling your pet. Limit visitors in the first month or two after transplant. Have your family members screen visitors. Ask if they've been around anybody sick recently they can carry lots of germs and not realize it. Also be careful with young children. Bless their hearts, they do not know it, but they get sick all the time because they don't have an immune system as well. So that is why we immunize our children. So even if you have grandchildren, and I know that they mean the world to you, try to think if they're sick that they should be staying away from you. Please avoid gardening in the first four months after transplant. And then when you do resume gardening, please use garden gloves and a mask and definitely wash your hands when you are done working in the dirt. Keep in mind, dirt is dirty. Every animal known to mankind uses the dirt as their restroom, so there are as many parasites and bacteria in the soil that you are releasing when you are working with the soil. Signs of infection. Again, fever greater than 100.4. A productive cough of yellowish greenish sputum. You may have tightness in your chest. Cloudy, burning, smelly urine. If you've ever had a bladder infection, you know what this feels like. It is very important that you let us know about this right away. 
What you need to keep in mind is your new kidney is closer geographically to your bladder and an infection in your bladder can get up into your new kidney easier. On the day you go home, please take a picture of your incision with your phone. You're going to monitor your incision twice a day until it is healed. You are going to look for increased redness, increased swelling, warmth to touch, any draining like pus or odor, or bright red blood. Please call us immediately. You need to call us if you are sick for greater than a four hour time frame. And I'm talking like you're in the bathroom continuously with nausea and vomiting or diarrhea and you are not able to keep anything down. You will dehydrate quickly. Your new kidney does not like to be dehydrated and we would rather hear from you earlier than later. Please call us if you're not able to keep your tacrolimus or cell sept down. Unfortunately, as gross as this may sound, we do encourage you if you throw up close to taking your pills that you do look at your emesis and make sure that you do not see whole pills in there. Okay, and then you need to call us and tell us what you actually see. You will need to call us if your blood pressure, the top number is greater than 180 or the bottom number is greater than 95 or if you are having symptoms of elevated blood pressure, blurred vision, spots before your eyes, and a headache that's not relieved by Tylenol. This slide does go over the dietary just briefly. Um, the dietitian will go over this information more thoroughly and give you a four to five page handout. Your new kidney does not like to be dehydrated. Fluid intake is very important. This will be something new for a lot of you who have been on a fluid restriction while you have been on dialysis. We now want you drinking somewhere between 64 to 128 ounces of fluid daily. The majority of that intake should be water, but obviously you need to mix it up with juices and decaffeinated beverages so you don't get bored. You are more than welcome to use the Mio Drops. We just encourage you to read the labels of the Mio Drops to make sure there is no grapefruit in them. Again, hydration is extremely important and you also need to be able to tell someone how much you have drank during the day. If you call us, that is one of our first questions, is how much have you had today? Please be able to say, I have had 64 ounces so far, or roughly 64 ounces so far today. Using describers like a lot and I've had enough make it very difficult for us to decide how much you have taken in for the day. You will have a catheter in for about three days after your transplant. When they remove that catheter, please do not hold your urine when you get the urge to go to the restroom. Holding this urine can cause some complications. When we placed your kidney into your body, it came with what is called a ureter. The ureter is the tube that takes the urine from the bladder, from the kidney into the bladder. We connected that ureter onto your bladder and that connection is very fragile until it is healed. So it takes a good seven days for that to thoroughly heal. So while that's healing, you want to make sure that your bladder is not getting overstretched during that process. When your catheter is taken out and the nurses are there in the hospital, they will check your bladder with a little scanning mechanism for the first couple of times to make sure you are emptying your bladder completely. This is just a picture showing how the kidney and the ureter and the bladder are in relationship to each other and it shows the connection and the ureter going into the bladder. Double voiding is important right after surgery or if you are a diabetic. 
the bladder becomes a little bit lax after anesthesia. So double voiding is when you walk into the bathroom, you go to the bathroom, get up, you walk around for a few minutes, sit back down again and try to urinate. Many times you will get additional urine out of your bladder by doing that, and this ensures that we are keeping the bladder empty. The other risk of retaining urine in your bladder is infections. Anytime there is urine sitting in the bladder, it is prone to breeding bacteria. So that is why we encourage you to keep that bladder empty. The Crede maneuver is just another manual type of expressing of the urine from the bladder, another way to just sort of help you keep your bladder empty. A ureteral stent is placed in the ureter during your transplant. This stent is there to ensure that the ureter stays open during the healing process and to facilitate urine flowing from the kidney into the bladder effectively. The stent will be removed in about four weeks post-transplant at the urologist's office at 222 Piedmont Avenue. You do not have to do anything special for this procedure. You may eat the day of this procedure. Um, there's nothing special that needs to be done. This is a picture of what the stent looks like. And then this shows you the stent inside the ureter. As you can see, the stent is inside the bladder. And that is how we are able to remove the stent. Um, it is an in-office procedure. Um, you are not put to sleep for this procedure. They have a flexible scope that has grabbers on the end of it and a camera, and they insert that into your urethra. They get hold of that stent, and then they pull it out. The procedure is brief, 20 to 30 seconds in length. It probably takes them longer to prep you for the procedure than removing it. As far as your activity when you go home, do not lift anything heavier than 10 pounds for the first six weeks. Keep in mind, a gallon of milk weighs eight pounds and four ounces. We have spoken about driving. Um, again, you need to be off all narcotics before you get behind the wheel and make sure that everything is well healed in case you need to make a quick action move on a highway. No strenuous activity for three months. Keep in mind, we did cut muscles when we placed your kidney. Um, you don't want to be coming back to us within the year for a hernia repair. There should be no intimacy until your incision is well healed and the stent has been removed, usually around six to eight weeks. It is very important when you go home that you rest because you did have surgery and resting is how your body heals. But you also need to be moving around during the day as well to prevent any complications such as pneumonia or clots in your legs. It is okay for you to go outside if it's nice and take a walk around your home. It's okay for you to walk out to the kitchen and fill your water pitcher. What we don't want you doing is laundry, fixing things like an eight course meal. Kind of think about what you are doing and what you just had done. Please be aware that there will be days where you feel like a million bucks and you think you can conquer everything. I promise you the next day you will feel like a penny and wonder why you overdid it the day before. As far as returning to work, we usually recommend staying out of work for about three months, and that's mainly because of the infectious risk. But if this is a financial burden, we ask that you discuss it with the team at one of your appointments. Incisional care. You are more than welcome to shower daily. You do not want to get into a bathtub or go swimming until that incision is thoroughly healed. We do discourage hot tubs, um, as the jets in a hot tub or a jacuzzi cannot get thoroughly clean and harbor lots of bacteria. When you are in the shower, you do not want to specifically wash the incision. You want to make sure that the staples have been removed before you do that, or if they used 
the glue to put your incision together that that is thoroughly dissolved and healed completely. Just wash around your incision and then rinse over it. Try not to saturate the incision too much. There may be days where you have some drainage coming out of your incision. If it's clear yellow, tan, or light red or pinkish, this is normal. Um, if this drainage seems to be a lot and you don't want to mess up your clothes or your furniture, get some dressings like ADD pads. But to be honest with you, maxi pads make great dressings and they have the um, adhesive tape that will adhere to your underwear and they're very absorbent and not nearly as expensive. Staples will be removed in about three to four weeks after your date of transplant. And we have already spoken about looking at your incision twice a day. You will always need to wear sunscreen protection factor of at least 30. Stay in the shade when possible and wear protective clothing and no sunbathing. The immunosuppression medication increases your risk for skin cancer. Which also brings up the topic, if you are not the one packing your pillbox when you go home, make sure if your loved one is packing your pillbox, they have gloves to wear when handling the immunosuppression medication, Celsept, Antichromis, to protect them as well. Um, you do want to monitor your skin on a regular basis for any new moles or any irregularities that are new. And we encourage you to follow up with your primary care or dermatologist once a year for complete skin checkups. Dermatologists are very busy these days with skin cancer. So make sure you are calling far enough in advance, a minimum of five to six months, to make sure that you get an appointment in a timely fashion. Your primary care physician, please maintain a relationship with your primary care physician. We, the transplant team, will primarily have our focus on the care of your kidney and the medications related to your kidney transplant. Yes, it will seem like initially the transplant team is maintaining the majority of your medications because we are seeing you the most in that first year. But after that first year post-transplant, please have your primary care resume routine health maintenance, mammograms, pap smears, prostate screenings. Those are all things that are primary care physician tasks. We, as your transplant team, will always continue to prescribe your immunosuppression medications. Please get your yearly flu vaccine. Please stay up to date on the pneumonia vaccine. Currently, I think they're recommending every three to five years, but that does change, so check with your primary care physician to what the recommendations are regularly. Please remember you are not to receive live vaccines. The most common live vaccines that we have at this point in time is the shingles vaccine that is called Zostavax, chicken pox vaccine, the flu mist, which they no longer make, and the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You are never to receive those ever again. If anybody asks you or talks to you about vaccines, please ask them, is this a live vaccine? And tell them you are immunosuppressed. There is a new shingles vaccine available. It is an inactivated dead vaccine called Shingrix. This is okay to get. Please be advised, do not get any vaccines for a minimum of 90 days after transplant and always talk with the team prior to getting any vaccines. If you are around someone who may have recently received a live vaccine, which is more likely a child of the age of one year, they typically get the measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox vaccine at that time. Guess what? You have a great excuse for not doing diapers during two to three weeks after they get that vaccine because they will be shedding that live virus in their urine and poop. 
Those who do well are the patients who take their medications at the same time every day. Drink your water. Keep track of your blood pressure, weight, temperature, and if you need to, blood sugars. Please keep all outpatient appointments and have your blood work drawn as directed. Please do not allow yourself to run out of medications. Please ask for refills seven to 10 days prior to running out. You are in charge of your own health. We, as the transplant team, are here to assist you. Please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions you have. Please remember, none of us consider any question to be stupid because we don't want you feeling afraid to ask us anything. Additionally, I have provided your post-transplant post long-term follow-up. You don't need me to read through this. You can go ahead and read through this. We also have a Facebook page for our kidney transplant recipients. This is a great way to interact with other patients who have been through kidney disease, dialysis, and a transplant. I always tell people sympathy can come from anybody walking down the street, but empathy will truly come from someone who has lived in your shoes to know what it is really like to have kidney disease and need a transplant. We also offer a support group that's held once a month on the first Saturday of every month. We do alternate having this up at our Westchester location as well. Please monitor the Facebook page for dates and times or if there's any changes. Again, this is a great way for you and your family members to interact with other people who have been affected by kidney disease and kidney transplant. Thank you.